Hello. How's it going? Hey, good. How about you? Sorry, I was late. I was I got caught up with something, and I you know came upstairs, and I realized that you know it was like fifteen minutes late. But uh, yeah, I joined. Oh, it's all right. Hope all your other classes are doing well so far. Yeah, yeah, they're fine. I had a I had a quiz, a chemistry quiz, and it was on nomenclature. So that was um taking a while because the stuff is I don't know. This is getting confusing. Like some of the things like that they teach us contradict other things that I've been taught before. So, and this professor doesn't always respond to his email or honestly, he never does. So I have to wait till the next class to ask him. So I was writing down all that stuff that I had questions on. Nomenclature, are you guys doing all the polyatomic ions in chem? Yep, you have all that kind of stuff. So polyatomic ions, binary compounds and acids. Acids and bases, pH and all that stuff? <clears throat> uh, not with pH yet, we're just naming the acids but that's coming up in a future lesson uh, i'd imagine Hopefully. so i kind of wanted to i want to just start this class the same way i start all my other calc classes by asking if you have any questions about anything at all because calculus builds on each other it's kind of learning calc is like building a house you can't build a house on no foundation the whole thing is going to crumble apart so we want to make sure we have a really really solid understanding of all the material that comes from what we've learned before before we build on it and learn new things. So do you have any questions about anything at all? Um, <clears throat> no, not really. Nothing about derivatives, um, limits, um, concavity, continuity, differentiability, good on all of that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I would say I am. Excellent. So I want to review derivatives because I want us to start um, start going into applications of derivatives because we're, we want to make sure we have a really good solid understanding of the derivative to help us put that information to work for us to solve complex problems we want to apply derivatives to real world situations so it's really important for us to have a good understanding of derivatives before we do that so i just, I just thought we could do a little bit of practice so let's say we have this function let's say we have f of x is equal to x minus three times sine of x. I'd like for you to please find the derivative for me. Find f prime of x. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. And I think you have permission to write on the board. Um, let me check. Yeah, I think I do. I do. Great. <clears throat> And what are the main tools we use to take derivatives? Uh, well, first it's going to be the power rule. And then it's, um, I'm trying to remember the ones for all the sine ones. Because well, there's another those one are... that starts with P. You have the power rule already. There's another one that starts with P. Do you remember that one? Um, Let's have yeah. a bit of a quick review. <clears throat> so what does the power rule tell us uh the power rule tells us how to differentiate when you have um x to a power exactly just x uh x when it can, when it has a coefficient I mean, it can have a coefficient. Very good. So we have m of x is x to the a power. And f prime of x is going to have to be a times x to the a minus 1 power. But it also applies to functions. What if we didn't have x to the a power? What if we had? a uh, different function to the a power. What if we had, for example, g of x to the a power? Does the, do the mechanics work the same way if we have a function and not just a single variable? Mm. So if we had, uh, example, what if we yeah, had, I think so. Cause there's a way to, there was a way to take, um, 
the derivative of a function, you have to, um, it's sort of like the power rule, but when you have a full function, it like you do, you take the um, exponent, multiply it by g of x, take the exponent, subtract one, and then you multiply that quantity by the derivative of the function g of x with no exponents. Perfect, exactly right. What do we call that rule? Oh, is it the product product rule or? Well, the product rule is one of them, but this is not. Product. What's the name of this rule that you just described for us? Taking the derivative of g of x and multiplying that by everything. What do we call that rule? One second, my mom's calling me. Salah Klasse. Aya de la Hikmet. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Um, Do you remember the name of this rule? We used to take the derivative of a composition of functions. Mm, uh, no, I don't remember its name. This is the chain rule. Oh, the chain rule. Wait, what about the one with a P? What does that one refer to? That one is the product rule. Oh, okay. So, the so I got the P so one. Whenever we have something like this, if we have f of x is equal to some function u times another function v, the derivative f prime of x is equal to the derivative of the first. So that would be u prime times the second plus the first, which is u times the derivative of the second, which is v prime. Well, extend that a little bit. Oh, I wrote that wrong, sorry. I meant to make that u times v prime. Derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. And that's when there you're multiplying. very closely related to this one. That one's when you're multiplying two different functions together, right? Well, you're thinking the product of the rule. product rule. Uh, the yeah, yeah, the product rule. When we divide a function by another function. Yeah. So let's say okay. we have is equal to u divided by v. Called the quotient rule because we have a quotient with one function upstairs and then we have a separate function downstairs. So do you remember how to take the derivative of a, a function like this where we have a rational expression, one on top and one on the bottom? I believe it's um the derivative of both of them. You take You have to take the derivative of both. Um, but I, hmm. you're on the right track. It does involve the derivative of u and v, but there is a very specific way of doing it. Let me let me get a piece of paper because I'll I'm gonna start taking notes during class. Good call. Let me know when you have paper and pencil, and we'll continue. I'm gonna get another Papers coffee right actually. Here. While you're doing that, I'm gonna refill my coffee real quick. Okay, I have a paper. It was right there, but uh, take your time. All right, I'm done. One nice thing about the quarantine is always being within reach of my coffee maker. <laughs> all, the nice. of, all the comforts of home, I love it. So um, we're gonna be, we were last talking about quotient rule. The quotient rule works like this. So if we have a top function, call that u, and a bottom function, call that v, the derivative is going to be the derivative of the top. So that would be u prime times the bottom. And then instead of plus like we do for the product rule, we're actually going to subtract them this time. It will be minus the top, times the derivative of the bottom. OK, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to put all that over the square of our bottom function. So in this case, it would be v to the second. And for completion's sake, we also have the chain rule. So if f of x is equal to u times v, and we want to take the derivative of this, you already described it pretty well. You gave a really good explanation about how the chain rule works. You didn't know what it was called, but the important thing is you knew the mechanics really, really well. And it's one of the tough ones. I would say that the chain rule is the, the toughest out of these four to really grasp get the hang of. So the chain Whoa. rule tells us that whenever we have a composition of functions, the derivative is going to be the derivative of the inner, the derivative of the outer function 
we're going to leave the inner one alone. And then we're going to multiply that whole thing times the derivative of the inner function, which is V prime. So that is the chain rule. That's all four of our basic derivative rules. Do you think we could also go over the um, derivatives of the uh, of the trigonometric functions? Because oh, yeah, def I I kind of forgot those, but you know, quickly just so I can get the notes down because I know how to apply them and whatnot. No problem. So sine and cosine are really simple. Derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Do you remember how to find the derivative of tangent? I think we have to rewrite tangent as sine over cosine. And then when we take um, the derivative of that e that expression, which is equal to tan, we uh, we could apply the, um, we can apply the quotient rule. Absolutely. I want you to do that for us. It's really good practice. And okay. props to you for remembering that. That's impressive. So you're absolutely right. We do want to write it as sine over cosine. So y is equal to tangent of x, also known as sine of x over cosine of x. I would like for you to find for us derivative of y with respect to x. All right, I'm going to keep writing these uh, rules really quickly, and then I'll get to it. Oh, yeah, no problem. No rush. Are you feeling any better, by the way? Oh, I'm feeling so much better. Thank you for asking. That's nice to hear. What was yeah. wrong, if you don't mind my asking? I just felt like general flu symptoms, like I had like, uh, eight okay. muscles and probably just a bad morning congestion and a little bit of coughing and sore throat. I think mainly I was just sleep sleep deprived in my body, saying, "Dude, get some sleep. I can't handle that much of this anymore." Well, I mean, you got your sleep right. Yeah. Okay, that's good. You take the derivative of v, or what would that mean in that case? So for the first part, we want to leave the inner function alone. So we always have u be the outer function. We always have v be the inner function. So when we're first taking the derivative of something using the chain rule, we're going to leave the inner function alone. We're not going to do anything with it, but we're going to take the derivative of the outer function. So for example, Wait. let's say we have what would be a good one. Let's maybe use sine of x squared. So if we have the function sine of x squared, what function would be u and what function would be v? So u would be sine and then v would be x squared? Absolutely. So what is the derivative of sine? Uh, cosine. Perfect. So we're going to have u prime of v. So we're going to change the sine into a cosine, but we're going to leave v alone. We're going to have oh, sine okay. cosine of x squared. And then what is the derivative so, of v? What is v prime? v prime 2x. Absolutely. That's so it. does this refer to when you're taking the, when you're taking the, uh, like a function of another function? Exactly. You have to use the chain rule whenever you have a function of another function, also known as a composition of functions. <clears throat> so the der if, derivative of a composition would be impossible without the chain rule. So if you had um like if you had u as g of x and v as h of x, would um u prime be g prime of x times v? Not g prime of x. It would be that's a really good g. question. Let's let's see what that would be like. So if we take the derivative of g of h of x, so h would be the inner function. So we're gonna leave that alone for now. We're gonna take the derivative of g. I think I'm gonna rewrite that. That was weird looking. So we're gonna have g prime we're going to leave h of x alone and then we're going to multiply that whole entire thing by the derivative of h of x so h prime of x and that's how we do that what would g prime mean then 
So g prime would be the derivative of whatever our outer function happens to be. So g is always going to be the outer function in this case. H of x would be the inner function. So g oh. prime would be the derivative of the outer function. Okay, so and in a problem, they would give you one value for like the x, and then that's how you would solve this pretty much? Well, they won't always give you a value for x. They might want you to, for example, leave it in terms of x? Yep, yeah, leave it in terms of x. But sometimes okay. they might ask you to find the derivative at a point. They might want, they might ask you, what is the instantaneous rate of change when x is 2? So you would find the derivative the way you normally do, and then you would just plug 2 in everywhere you see an x into your final answer. So your answer would not be a function, it would just be a number. And that's, well, the, that's the main difference between a derivative and an instantaneous rate of change. So a derivative is a function, an instantaneous rate of change is a number. So isn't the instantaneous rate of change so that's like, um, so they give you the point and then you just take the X coordinate of that point and then you plug it in. Yeah, you always plug it in wherever you see an X and we'll be going over that a little bit later. Okay. It is okay. an extension of what we're doing here. For lack of a better word. Okay, so. The yep, derivative, can, okay. Yep, secant squared x, perfect. And then we also have cosecant of x derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x times cotangent of x. And then we have secant of x. The derivative of that would be secant of x times tangent of x. And then we have just one more. The derivative of cotangent of x is going to be negative cosecant squared of x. Let me know when you have all this. Just about there. All right. Will there ever be a need to calculate the second derivative of these, of the trigonometric functions? Oh, absolutely. When you're finding uh, concavity, yes. Within like sinusoids? Yeah, within all mm. six of these. Okay. I got it all, by the way. All right, great. So let's see if we can remember some of the other common derivatives that we might encounter. Oh yeah, logarithms. Let's start with e to the x. Do you remember what the derivative of e to the x is? I think it was just e due to um, the natural log, uh, either e or one, I think. Yeah, it was really simple. 
Yeah, exactly. The derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Ah, e to the x, OK. And it's the only function that has that unique property, that the derivative of itself is itself. No other function has that property. Wait, and this was why? I remember you went over it, but don't exactly remember. Um, if we generalize it, what if we take, oh, excuse me for one second. So if we generalize it, what if we have a different constant that's not e? What if we had a to the x? Let's see if we can take the derivative of a to the x. Derivative of a to the x, it's one of those ones you just want to have committed to memory. So the derivative of a to the x power is going to be a to the x times the natural log of a. So what um, happens if we apply this to take the derivative of e to the x? So we're going to have e to the x times natural log of e. And what is the natural log of e, by the way? One, right? Exactly. So we're just doing e to the x times one. And so we just get e to the x. The, um, the function of x where it's equal to a to the x, is it um is the derivative what it is only because that only because x is in the exponent only yeah that's true because x is the exponent and a is the number we and have you're number taking it in terms of x so that would make it a little more complicated yep exactly okay So let's say we have log base a of x. How do we take the derivative of this function? Hmm. We could um, turn it into exponent exponent form and then take the derivative of that since we have the um, formula for it. That might not be too helpful in this situation. And this is another one that you just want to have committed to memory. So I think I want to here bring it down a little bit. I might need a little more room to write it. So if f of x is log base a of x, the derivative of that is going to be 1 over x. And then we're going to divide that by natural log of our base. So natural log of a. And let's try one more. So it's just a, could you put that all over um, in under one and just say <laughs> X times LN of A natural law? Yep, exactly. You could just make it one fraction, one unit fraction, yes. Would, all, would um, putting that in parentheses and then adding a negative one exponent to the parentheses work as well? Definitely. Here, let's do that too. That's a good call. Also say that is x times natural log of a to the negative one power. Yep, you definitely could. What if we have a really specific value for a? What if instead of log just base a of x, what if we make a into e? So what do we call a logarithm with a base of e? Uh, natural log. Yes. And then you write ln and you don't have to specify the base. Well, natural log does specify the base. We just, this means that we have a base of e. E, yeah, yeah. But like you understand that, so you never really have to write the e after that. Exactly. No sense in putting e twice. So how do we take the derivative of natural log of x using our formula we have above? So in this case, a would be equal to e. How do we take the derivative of log base e of x? 
Um, so no matter what base yeah. we have, this one over X is not going to change. It doesn't oh, okay. matter if we have a base of one or two or 10 or E, the one over X is always going to be there. So we want to start by, oh, sorry. <laughs> I want to start by writing that. So I mean, one over could, X is always going to Would it be one over X times one over log of A? Not just any log, but natural log. In this case, it's going oh, to be, natural what log. is E in this case? Sorry, I, I kind of gave away the answer. I meant to say, what is A in this case? What is A? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> It'd be E then. Yep, exactly. So what is natural log of E? Natural log of E is E. Not quite. Wait, oh, no, that's the, my bad. Uh, natural log of E, it's one. It's one. Exactly. Because you, you only have to multiply, you have to raise that to one to get exactly it to E. Exactly, right. So what is the final form of the derivative of natural log after we simplify everything that can be simplified? Oh, actually, it's just one over X. Perfect. That works out nicely. It does, it really does. And this is the, we're gonna be using this far more commonly than all of the other log bases. I wanna say, I mean, don't quote me on this, but I wanna say we're not even gonna be using any other log bases in this class besides E. <laughs> wow. So it's good to have E, all the, the ones involving E and the ones involving natural log committed to memory because we're going to be using them a lot. Any questions so far? Uh, no, all good. All right, I want to give you enough time to copy all of this down. And then I have it, I have it all done. Perfect, excellent. So let's go back to some of those derivative practice problems we were doing at the beginning of the class, but before we do that, let me ask you, I know you're interested in doing some makeup classes because we missed a few of them. Um, when are you next available for that? Let's see. Um, are you maybe available today by chance? Uh, yeah, what time were you thinking today? Well, I have a tutoring, I think three straight hours after this. So how will oh. that maybe? Um, so you, maybe like five or I mean, actually six? Yeah, six would be all right. I can do six. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. How do you feel about doing two hours of calculus in a day? Is that too much for you or do you think it'll No, work? not at all. Not at all. Yesterday I must've done like four hours and it was only for the homework. So. Oh, we can also do homework if you want. We can work on homework if you have any questions about it. Uh, no, it's actually, it's always due like on Wednesday. So I, I mean, I've been kind of lazy about it. Like I always do it on Wednesday, but it just, it takes a while. Like yesterday, um, I understood all of it pretty much. I, you know, I used the textbook where I, I, I just like clicked um, show me an example sometimes, but um, it was about using uh, the first and second derivatives as well as the first and second derivative rules to um, locate relative minimum or maximum points of a function. And, uh, and this function was like a real life example of something that you always wanted to minimize or maximize. So like there was really one weird where it was like a, right? yeah, for the most part. Yeah. So there was like one, one of them, for example, was like, uh, there was like a package and it had to be of a, a specific girth and a specific length. Uh, and you were, and you had like this much money or this much material to make the package or whatever and to send it. And um, it said, it asked you to maximize like the total volume or something, you know, and I just, so it was maximizing certain like functions and using things like the constraint equations and whatnot. And at the end, there were these two problems where I don't remember what exactly were the questions, but it ended up being like, I had to use the chain rule. Um, I had to use the chain rule, I think thrice for like one expression. So I took the derivative of one thing and then, uh, you know, the dirt. So when you use the chain rule, you have the exponent thing, the first product, and then you take the derivative of what the original function was inside the parentheses. Well, inside the parentheses, the function was also raised to an exponent. So I ended up using the chain rule like three different times just for one problem or just for those two problems. And it took a long time because like, you know, there was crazy numbers and and it all came out to the smallest, simplest answers. And I was just unbelievable. That much work went into getting numbers like 13. And, you know, it was crazy. But um, otherwise, I understood it all.
the optimization is tough. Do you want to maybe go over some of that right now? I mean, we can do anything you want. You're the boss. We can learn anything you want to learn. Go over anything you want to go over. Um, like I said, I understood it, but if you want to see it, I'd be happy to go get it because it was an interesting problem. You know, it just well, it mean, took just, a while. Just in general, I mean, optimization is tough. I'm not talking about like the specific problems you did, but if you want, we can go over just optimization problems. If I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you feel pretty good with optimization or do you want to practice it a little bit more? Because most people in my class, the classes that I teach, they want to go over it a lot. Um, let's see. I think my issue was figuring out which um, like equations or functions to use. But in terms of using the first and second derivatives and, and their rules, their respective rules, I think I got that down. But I mean, I always could, I, I can always go over it again because like sometimes I would forget, like if you, um, if it came out, if you, if you solved the, uh, the second derivative and it came out to be zero, and then when you solve the, the, just the first derivative and you got multiple X's, you would have to put in each X into the derivative. And I would forget that sometimes. So I, uh, yeah, I like, we can, if you want to, if you can, let's go over it. I would say, yeah. Well, actually, we don't have enough time to do an optimization problem right now. There's only 10 minutes left. But I'm thinking later on in the day, if when we come back, we could do some optimization problems because myself included, optimization is the first time that most students truly struggle with calculus. When they're taking calc for the first time, limits are easy, derivatives are easy, but optimization is the first time that we mostly struggle collectively. It's like the first difficult hurdle mm -hmm. in calc class. So we can definitely go over that later today. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that my mom is visiting from out of town and I'm going to be going to dinner with her. Can we maybe do like maybe later tonight? Would eight o'clock work for you tonight? Yeah, yeah, that would be fine. All right, cool. Eight o'clock calc tonight. I'll see you there. And we still have 10 minutes left right now. So let's maybe just brush up on some more derivatives, make sure we're good with that. So at right. the very beginning, we had this function. We had x times... <laughs> You know, we had x minus 3 sine of x, and we wanted to take the derivative of this. So what, kind of the, what kind of derivative rules do we need for this? We are going to need the power rule and the sum rule. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I don't know which rule it is, but it just breaks up the x and the uh, 3 sine of x. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, walk me through this one. Well, so first I would write it as um, d over d of x uh, of x, and then plus d over d of x uh, of negative 3 sine x. And I would split it. And I think that's the sum rule of derivatives. Uh, and then, or do you want me to write it? Uh, yeah, sure. OK. Go for it. Four is yours. So So here we're going to use the power rule for the first for x. So it'll come out to um, 1. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> can't remember. I think we use um, the, it's not the product rule, but I don't think it's the coefficient rule. But this might be only just for limits I, where you take the 3 and move it outside of the d over d of x. Yep, that's something that works for every calculus operation. Limits, derivatives, integrals, infinite series. That's something that can be done with all of them. So what, what is it called again for the derivatives when you're taking the derivative? Well, I just norm, well, we call it differentiation. The process of taking the derivative is called differentiation. Well, no, but like moving this three like right here and then taking the derivative of this stuff of whatever is left. What is that? Like when you take the coefficient of, of uh, out, what, do, what would you call that part? Um, good question. I don't know if it has a real name. I would just say that a moving the constant multiple out of the operator preserves equality. Mm -hmm. I would just say that. Maybe just call it the constant multiple rule. 
Okay. I think I can look in my uh, textbook to see if they have a name for it, but yeah, I don't. I learned that for limits at first, but um, anyways. So once you've done that, you um you're gonna want to take you're gonna want to apply the product rule to sine of x. Maybe not the product rule. This no, is just, we, can we could just take the derivative. Yep, exactly. Oh, oh yeah, because no, the product rule is for two functions being multiplied. This is just one single function that we know that the derivative yeah. is cosine of x. Okay, yeah. So this, so then we get one plus, and then we have negative three of times the quantity cosine of x. So it becomes one plus negative three cosine of x and Pretty sure you could graph this. I don't remember how, but this very looks very graphable. You have the one and then the negative three. Forgot what those do, but I could. can review that. Sometimes we can use a graph to analyze information about a function. We can graph the function and then the derivative, kind of like what we did a few classes ago when we compared the graph of a function and the graph a graph of the derivative of the function to determine information about it. But we're not going to do that today. Oh, actually, I do have a question about that. I got another one of those problems. It was the same exact kind of problem. And so I did what um, we did, which was you look for points on the graph that you believe is the main one. And you look for uh, points where the derivative is zero. So the tangent, the tangent line is a horizontal line. And then you look for, I think, inflection points at that same x on the other graph. And that's how you deduce whether it is or isn't the derivative. And um, they their graph um, on the derivative graph, like the where the, the points where it changed from increasing to decreasing, didn't exactly line up with the points of the actual graph where the tangent line uh, or where the tangent line was horizontal. So I was wondering like why it didn't. I got what they were trying to say, but you know, like I maximized the image and stuff too, and it just, I don't know. Whoa. Um, <laughs> we might not have enough time, but I definitely do want to see that. Can you okay. write that on the board? Uh, let me, um, can I pull it up? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, let's do that. All right. You, the floor is yours when you're ready. Sure. Okay. Uh, no, I think it was no, 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 no. No, it was definitely 2.4. Might have been towards the end. Okay, you can see this, right? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, right here. Okay, nice. Determine which is the derivative of the other. So at the very beginning, it's good just to make, make a guess and then see if your information supports that guess. So. Does f of x have, let's say that f is the derivative of g. So if f is the derivative of g, that means wherever f has a zero derivative, g would have an, an x-intercept. So where does f have, play, uh, do you see any locations where f has a zero derivative? Yeah, so I would say right here, here, and here. All right, very good. And then does G have X intercepts at those same exact X values? Yes. Yep. And that's just a really quick way to verify that and it really is the derivative of the other. So wherever F of X has zero derivatives, G of X would have X intercepts. So what the, so, oh, so the, oh, so the derivative function just has to have X intercepts? It has to have X intercepts. At the, the points. derivative has zero derivatives where it has a horizontal tangent line. Okay, and this so this is because um, why why is this again? I so I it's don't really because know. if 
one of them is the derivative of the other. So let's say we have um, Oh, that's X. cool. You can write on there. Yep. Nice. Let's say F prime of X is equal to G of X. So G <laughs> is the derivative of F of X. So if the derivative of this point, I'm going to call this C. So if F prime of X at C, F prime of C is zero, then G of C is also going to be zero. So if oh. this is zero, the other one is zero. And the same thing mm. applies to this one right here and this yeah. one right there. So, okay. So, if, okay. So then, okay. That makes sense. Cause the red one only has two points where the derivative is zero and there aren't even any X intercepts for the blue one. Exactly. Okay, that should have went way easier then, but I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down really quickly. Go for it. Or actually, no, I'll just, I'll write down how to solve or what to look for. And then I'll use that homework as a, an example. All right. Well, that's all we have time for, for today. If you don't have any questions, you're free to go. I'll see you at eight o'clock tonight. Nope. Eight o'clock tonight. I'll be there. So I won't be 15 minutes late either. All right. No worries. If, if you think you might be late, if you have trouble logging on, definitely shoot me a text or call me real quick and we'll, I'll see if I can help you. Okay. Uh, no, I don't. I just go here, open Zoom from down here, and then uh, plug in the uh, meeting code. Because every time I click the link, it tries to download Zoom again. But, you know, obviously, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, no worries. I'll see you at 8. All right. See you at 8.